Well, let me tell you a little bit about Linda Ray. Linda is crazy about Toastmasters. That's one thing I've learned. She is very excited every time she hears about any member's promotion or life that has transfer, transformed because of their Toastmaster experience. Linda's right there cheering them on. She has an experience of richness in the Toastmasters program, filling club roles, and serving in almost every leadership role, including the district governor and district director and regional advisor to Mexico, Southern California, and yes, Arizona. And in Colorado, I know she's up there there as well. She is a vision board expert, speaker, trainer, and a master mind facilitator. Outside of Toastmasters, Linda empowers entrepreneurs and individuals to realize their dreams using the power of the vision board and how to focus in on your goals. Linda facilitates masterminds that focus on, focuses on goal achievement and on business building, speaking to service clubs. Today, Linda is sharing the secrets of a winning team in Toastmasters and in life. These secrets to help Toastmaster teams focus on working together to build the community that enhances their lives and careers with their members. Linda also loves gardening, traveling, and being very silly with her grandchildren. Please help me welcome to the virtual stage, Linda Ray. Yeah. Have you ever been a member of a team that just didn't work well together. Isn't it great that this is a webinar and you don't have to raise your hands and nobody will know that you sold them out. <laughs> Having three things in common will really help you with that. The first one is having a clear shared vision. The second one is understanding how each member of the team contributes to a winning team. And last but not least is how leaders impact team success. And if you're sitting there thinking you're not a leader, you are. Everything you do influences other people and that's part of leadership. So even without the title, you can lead. So let's explore the importance of a shared vision. And I'm gonna to save Toastmasters to last. There are many forms of and definitions of vision and mission. It seems like many people think they go hand in hand, that there's no difference. The way I've heard them separated is that a vision is our big picture, how we want to influence the world today and in the future. The mission is how we do it. Now, not all missions are written that way, but if you can separate them out and really see that that's what they're about, it just makes it simpler. But don't get too worried about whether a vision is a mission or a mission is a vision. It's just having a clear picture of your team, what you are going to accomplish, how you're going to do it, and who's going to do it. I could actually end right there. That's all you need to know. It's that simple. Vision statements are kind of fun to read. Uh, they're the essence of really what is a company all about. And when I look at some famous missions and some famous visions, I like to look at Disney first. Disney's vision is to make people happy. Do you think they succeed? Do you think a company, a multi-quadrillion dollar company like Disney that has its hands in so many places, not just Mickey Mouse cartoons anymore, wouldn't you think that their vision would be rather intricate and detailed? No. Can't you just see Walt Disney going, nope, we're just here to make people happy. So John Formica, who I've met through some seminars that we've both attended, was the director of customer service at Disney. 
And he told a story to us one day about how someone lived out that vision. And he was a street sweeper. You know, when you walk down the streets in Disneyland and they're always so clean because someone's out there with those little push uh, receptacles and a broom and they're sweeping up something just the second you drop it. Well, one of those street sweepers heard a couple bemoaning that they couldn't find the place to get a certain drink that they'd heard about. They'd been walking and they were tired and they really wanted this special lemonade. I don't even remember which character it was associated with, but it was a Disney, a specific Disney character lemonade. Well, this street, street sweeper knew that his number one job was to make everyone happy. And he knew that his street was clean and that he had some time. So he just came over and said to that couple, you know, I know exactly where you can get that lemonade. Let me take you there. Can you imagine the surprise on their face? Like, number one, a street sweeper even cares about the image of Disneyland or that they're going to take time out of their job to walk me where I need to go. Now that's a vision just lived out in living technicolor. When you're thinking about what your job is, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, or yes, where it's where we all get crazy, or at least I do here in Toastmasters, we can always go the extra mile to make somebody's day. I mean, we have no idea what's going on in their life. Just a smile can change somebody's day. So other visions, Microsoft, see if this fits in your mind. Their vision is to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. That's pretty simple. It doesn't say anything about a computer. Although we know that computers and programs and all the things that we use have everything to do with what we achieve, right? Another very simple vision. Someone else with very clear customer service in their background is the Four Seasons Hotel chain. A street sweeper there, if they had a street sweeper, perhaps a carpet sweeper at a Four Seasons would do the same thing for that elderly couple because we believe our purpose is to create impressions that will stay with you for a lifetime. And I'm sure that couple still remembers that street sweeper. It also says we have chosen to spe specialize in the industry, the hospitality industry, I'm sorry, by offering only experiences of exceptional quality. Our objective is to be recognized as the company that manages the finest hotels, resorts, and residences everywhere we locate with the finest service. So this next one, I think, is just about as funny as it can be. Southwest Airlines. Think about Southwest Airlines. So they're dedicated to being the highest quality customer service delivered with a sense of warmth, friendliness, individual pride, and company spirit. But their vision? To be the world's most loved, most flown, and most profitable airline. Notice that most loved is first. I'm sure they're still trying to figure out how to get loved again after their many, many canceled flights when they didn't realize that so many of us were going to get crazy and excited about going out and traveling again. And they just didn't have the capacity because everybody hadn't come back to work. But I can bet knowing what I've read about Southwest Airlines, even when they have a hiccup, they're going to do whatever they can to get that image back and to be that loved airline. I mean, do you fly Southwest? Certainly is in our neighborhood. I don't fly it very much, but the people I know that do, they think I'm crazy for flying one of those other airlines. So they're living up to their, their vision. I'm going to tell you a former vision of the Utah Jazz, because I think it's wonderful. Larry Miller, of all the car dealerships, used to own the Utah Jazz, who you're going to hear about a little bit more, the Utah Jazz, that is. At any rate, Larry Miller, who has a dealership here in Denver, and I can tell you, their car dealership does this. 
what they said about the Utah Jazz is they wanted to be a great place to work on and off the court. So they didn't just care about their star million dollar athletes. They really cared about their people. And then they went on to talk about the experience for the people that use their services and how it's so important to make sure that they deliver a first class experience, even to that person at the Utah Jazz in the tippy top of the stadium or that person that's buying the car that's not buying the car, but just came in for an oil change. Service keeps running through all this. Have you noticed? Service, is that something you can see? Maybe you don't see it, but you sure feel it. Many theme parks have great ones like Disney. I can remember we had Joel Manby, who was one of the Golden Gavel winners in uh, Toastmasters several years ago. And he works for all the Six Flags parks and some other amusement parks with different names like Elitch is here in Denver. He's their director. And he just wants to make sure that they greatly exceed expectations with genuinely friendly, caring people who take pride in what they do. So I'm not going to the Toastmaster mission, vision, the club mission, the district mission right now. I want you to think about it as we go through this. How does this relate to me? How does it relate to my role in Toastmasters? How does it relate to my role at home and at work? Because really, we are always on stage, even if we don't know someone is watching us. We've all heard quotes from people in the public eye that have had someone come up to them at some point and say, you may not know that I was in the audience one day, but what you said changed my life. Do you realize you have that power? Both for the good and the not so good that you do. So are you paying attention to the impact that you make when something goes wrong and when something goes right? Because we're in, no matter whether we know it or not, as Toastmaster members, we are in the customer service business. Number one, so many of our presidents have said the top of the pyramid is not me, the president. I'm on the bottom. You, the member, are on the top, which means that our number one job is the experience that we give to our Toastmasters. Now, we can debate how we do that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But just remember, am I making an impression that makes the members I'm with today want to stay? Because don't you want retention in your club? The number way, one way to get it is to make people feel great. Even a smile can make someone feel great when they're having a bad day. So I want to tell you a story. And it's the story that I heard at a Stage Time University event with Darren LaCroix. The speaker was Mark Eaton from Utah. He was a member of the Utah Jazz. He's an All-American basketball player. He's also a Toastmaster, or he was. Unfortunately, he had a bike accident this year, and he's no longer with us. But he is the hero of mine. And pretty soon you might hear and understand why. He was a high school basketball player, and he played for four years. At that point, he was about 6'10", which is pretty darn tall for someone in high school. But how many people have you known that are really tall? What else do they have that's really big? Feet. Now, he didn't say this, but this is my picture, that an 18-year-old kid is still trying to figure everything out, and not everything works as well as it maybe could. And being a gangly six ten foot ten person, maybe he just didn't have it all together yet. It's time to go on the senior trip, and he didn't get to go. They took someone else to give them a chance. That's going to happen to him again in his career. It's a double. 
He came up with, after all of the story that I'm going to tell you, that there are four commitments to a winning team. And I'm going to let you know what they are as we go along. He went to trade school after high school because he got cut from the team, right? He worked as a mechanic. One day, a customer started talking to him. He says, you're really tall. Yeah, you're right. Don't go where you're going. I have to. Do you play basketball? I asked you not to go there. Man didn't give up. He got his car fixed. He left. He came back the next day. Didn't need anything for his car. He just said, I'm Mark Lubin. I'd really like to see you play basketball. He says, I'm Mark. How can I help you with your car? Well, Mr. Lubin said, let's go for a ride and I'll show you what's wrong with it. He got him out in the car, talked to him for quite a while about why he should play basketball, that it would be a different thing to do than to be in a great mechanic shop. Mark was not interested. But Mr. Lubin came back, this time with Ben Nader, who was 6'11". He said, this is one of my players. I know how to coach tall people. I know the secret to tall people. And I'm willing to bet when you played on your team, no one taught you how to be the right kind of team player for someone who's as tall as you are. He still was not interested. Coach Lieben said, just come over to this UCLA court with us. And we're just going to throw a few balls around. You, Sven, and I. Well, he really didn't want to do it, but he did. And it was interesting because he learned some things he'd never been taught. And Coach Lubin says, it's not surprising me at all. High school coaches probably teach a full load of classes and then coach basketball after school. I specialize in coaching basketball players, and my specialty is tall basketball players. I would love for you to work with me for a while. Well, he got him to really play basketball. He got him onto a team in a junior college, and Mark played with that team for two years. One day, he was out at a pickup basketball game, and he was running as fast as he could, and he was trying to do everything everywhere on the court. He was guarding. He was shooting. He was doing it all. He heard a tap. He heard a tap. He felt a tap on his shoulder. But considering when you hear who the tap is from, he probably heard it too. This man said, I think we need to talk. I want to show you what your job is. He, he looks at him and he goes, well, my job is to make sure we win the game. I need to guard. I need to shoot. I need to do this. He says, nope. See that basket over there? That's your job. Your job is to make sure no ball goes in that basket. Don't worry about the running. You've already figured out you can't keep up with them, which is why you're over here panting out of breath because you're trying to run. And your job is not to shoot. Your job is to get the ball to the man inside who can make the basket every time. And you can do that better than anyone with your height. It's so much easier for you. Well, he got a walk-on job at the junior college. And eventually, he went on to play at UCLA because UCLA noticed him. Quite a story for a kid who wouldn't talk about basketball but it doesn't end there. Number one, know your job is just the beginning of what it is we need to know when we're on a team. And think about teams. Basketball is a team for a reason. They work together, right? And they do work together. When they work well together and everybody is working on what they're supposed to be doing, it works like clockwork, which is the second rule or the second secret. First, you know your job. Number two, you do what you're told. 
So he was told not to run, not to guard, not to shoot, but make sure nobody else got that ball. But one of his players that could make the basket, right? Yes, ma'am. Just a side note, one of the reasons that Coach Lubin was such a great coach for tall players is that he played for a Lithuanian Olympic team and his coach was tall and Coach Lubin was tall. And that's where he learned the secrets. You never know where you're going to learn the secrets that help you to be great on a team. So listen to those bits of wisdom people give to you. So... Long story short, at the end of college, he didn't get drafted. Coach Lubin called in some favors, did some things, and got him a, a tryout at the Utah Jazz. And the rest is history. Mark played for the Utah Jazz, who had lost almost every game, it seemed like, for the preceding two years. And that's where the vision of the Utah Jazz that I gave you earlier came in, to be a wonderful place for people to work on and off the court. Mark went on to play for UCLA. He became a star. He played with stars. So he knew his job. He did what he was told. Number three, he made other people look good. It's not about being the star. It's not about being the president. It's not about being the division director. It's not about being the district director. It's about having a team that all understand what their job is, that all do what that job is, do what they're told. Now, if you're anything like me, that do with your told part, that's kind of hard sometimes. I have a better idea. I should be doing this job. Do you ever hear that in Toastmasters? I have. In fact, just a side note again, when I was region advisor, I had seven districts and I was surprised that what most districts talked to me about the most was the conflict. Think about it. We come to Toastmaster leadership all because I want to do this. I want to do that. I have this goal. I'm going to do this. And then we get thrown into a team of all these I, 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 I's. And I haven't learned in Toastmasters yet how to be a we, 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 we. So just kind of park that for later. But remember, as we talk about making other people look good, someone may have the job you want. You may get to have it next year. But let's make them look good when they do the job. What do you think? That helps Toastmasters. So anyway, make people look good. They won a game one night, the Utah Jazz. Well, they won a game many nights. But this particular night, I'm telling you, Mark Eaton was the star of the game. But it was still at the point that Mark Eaton was becoming a star in the NBA. Carl Malone was a star. In fact, he may have been the biggest star in the NBA that year. So who got interviewed after the game? Not the star of the game, the star of basketball. What did he do? Well, what really contributed to your win tonight, Carl? You know, it was the incredible play of Mark Eaton. If he hadn't gotten the ball to me as many times as he did, we would not have won this game. He is so undervalued by the press, but he is what makes this team come together. What did Carl Malone just do? He gave the glory to someone else. He made someone else look good. There are many times when we're on a team that someone else gets the glory for the work that we do. I remember it well in the 12 years I've been in Toastmasters and the 50 years I've been working. But it's part of what goes with being on a team. Rule number four is, is coming up, but right now, can you hear my dog barking at the toast stand? Do what you're told to do is number two. Make others look good is number three. And number four, protect others. 
are we starting to see a trend? It's not about you doing everything you want to do. It's about you looking out for other people. So how do you protect others? I mean, honestly, we watched football game last night where a couple of the, well, maybe we did. It was the first football game of the season for the NFL last night with an amazing victory at the end. Did Tom Brady win that game? A lot of people are giving him credit for winning that game. But how many people were protecting him? How many people were protecting the kicker that made the final field goal? And how many people like the Gronk did plays, made plays that weren't exactly the play that was designed, but because he knew where his quarterback would be, he knew how to make his quarterback look good and be where the ball went instead of where he was expecting it to go. That's another bit of teamwork. So protect others. Don't you wish you had a front line like that group last night protecting you? Well, the way to get a team that protects you that way is to model the behavior you want to see. Do you protect other people? Do you help them when they're struggling? Is your PR vice president having trouble getting people to the meeting? Is your membership vice president having trouble getting to the meeting? Can you step in and take care of the new guest? Help them get a membership packet? Can you help the PR vice president with some posting on social media? What else can you do to help others, to protect others and help them do their job? It's so important. I can remember when I was district governor, there was one person in our district who just loved to needle me. I don't know why to this day that I was not his favorite person, but he loved to just pick on me. And I had another friend who, believe it or not, wasn't seven foot four, like Mark Eaton grew to be, but he was about six, eight. And when he would see this other person picking on me, he would come stand between us because he was protecting others. He didn't need to do that. He had no leadership role in the district, but he knew <laughs> five, six Linda was being picked on by six, two person. And he was just going to come help Linda feel a little bit stronger. We all can do that. It's such a good thing to do. So that's the story of the Utah Jazz. They were losing every game. They found a player that really nobody had ever heard of. But because somebody made him look good, Coach Lubin made him look good, he got a walk-on at the Utah Jazz and went to play for them and became an all-star, the first ever all-star for the Utah Jazz. And he's still revered. He's one of the few people over seven feet in that decade or the decade after that played basketball. Now it seems something's going on that we have lots of seven foot peak players. So know your job, do what you're told, make others look good and protect others. I really welcome questions in the chat at this point because I'm going to go off script and into my Toastmaster role as a recovering region advisor. Once you've been a leader in Toastmasters, it's addictive. And I've noticed a lot of past, are there any past district governors watching or past district directors, I should say now, or on the call? I know I belong to a club with one of your past district governors, uh, Nancy Star Cassidy, because we've started a club for past district governors. And uh, it's so much fun to see her again and be in a club with her. But I always advise when I'm mentoring a district director that when June 30th comes, it's your turn. Step back and make others look good. And I like to say, bite your tongue. And why do I say that? Because the next district director is probably not going to do it the way you did. And it's really helpful if those of us that have been there don't continually tell them how to do it better. Let's go say, how can I help? And when you see them doing something well, do you remember the One Minute Manager, that great book 
Well, you have to probably be as old as I am to know that book. But the One Minute Manager, the number one thing that he did that made him a successful manager, well, there were two, actually. He would manage by walking about, which I thought was such an unusual frame or phrase. He would walk around. Are you looking at the clock to tell me how much time I have? No. I'd love it if you would give me a clue how much time I have, though. I, because this part of the speech is much different than I usually do. At any rate, the one minute manager would manage by walking about. In other words, not staying in his ivory tower, but going down and talking to the people that are working. And what did he do? He caught them doing something good. He didn't go down and say, oh my gosh, I've been watching your numbers and you just really need to get it together. No, he went back down and he said, oh, I love how you're putting that project together. We need more people like you. Maybe you could share with us your clever way to making that happen faster. Or just, you're always here. We really appreciate you for always showing up. Or, or just, gee, you have a nice smile today. It is contagious with everyone around you. Catch them doing something right. I don't have my props next to me but I carry sticky notes with me that are heart-shaped and star-shaped. And when I'm at a Toastmaster meeting and I see people doing something wonderful, I'll write a little note on the star or the heart and just give it to them. Well done. I like how you did whatever it is. You should see them light up. You know, you can do that. You don't have to be a district director to do that. I actually did it long before I was in the trio. And I still do it. And then I forget about it. And then I'm really happy when I pick it back up. So how do you give a star <laughs> in a Zoom meeting? And my dog is knocking my light over. He's decided he's ready to come sit right by me. Sorry about that. But I don't lock my dogs out when I'm online. You can do a chat. You can just send a chat to somebody that just did something great and say, wow, that was awesome. Hopefully they read chat. Or you can send them an email afterwards. But the more recognition we can give people, the better they feel. You know, we're always giving certificates. We're all, we always have now in Pathways, we have those badges we can earn. We have different levels. And we're constantly reminding our members to give recognition to each other for a reason that helps keep us engaged in, in the program. So be the one minute manager, walk around, find people doing something right and give them credit. Now I'm going to dip into some of the vision and mission of Toastmasters. Does anyone know the district mission or the club mission? Colleen's nodding her head. Now, if we were in a real Zoom meeting and somebody wanted to stand out, I would let people shout out, but I'll take the. Pressure. I don't, I do not know the district mission. Lisa did, was well, she's nodding her head for that. She well, knows Lisa, it all. You want to tell me what it is? Lisa? I muted twice so that way I didn't interrupt. We help build new clubs and support all clubs in achieving excellence. Yay. You know when at the very beginning I said everything is simple? I honestly think the second half of the district mission is what we're all about. And I'll explain that to you in the board brand promise in a little bit. So I'm, if you have a manual, a leader manual, I have an old one when they used to print them, people look at it and go, how can I get one of those? Well, get some shiny paper and print the manual off of the website because Toastmasters doesn't print them for us anymore. But First page of every manual, every leader manual, no matter what level of leadership you're at, is the mission, the district mission, the club mission, our values. Who knows our values? It's rise. Respect, integrity, service, and excellence. Ooh, excellence again. That seems to be a recurring theme. Our mission of Toastmasters International, 
we empower individuals to become more effective communicators and leaders. The club mission, we provide a supportive and positive learning experience in which members are empowered, there's that empower word again, to develop communication and leadership skills resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. So how do you sell Toastmasters? I don't say it's a speaking organization. I don't say it's communication and leadership. I say, we do two things really well in the list of the many things that we do really well. We help people grow in confidence and we help them build an incredible resume. Those I think are two selling points that if your club is struggling to grow that you can use right now. Go post on Facebook today. Would you like to enhance your resume for that next job interview? Ask me how joining Toastmasters will do that for you. And you can find some videos on our website that help you do that. Some two new ones, very recently new. Or someone you know who's just always shy and standing back and saying to you, I don't know how you always do that. Well, come to Toastmasters. I bet you'll grow in confidence quickly. Those are two things we do that we don't brag about enough. And we do it in a supportive environment, which is what it said in the club mission, which is helping other people look good, protecting others, doing our job, and doing what we're told in a way that when we have a role, we make sure we fill that role in the way we should. And that's excellence. All of that together is excellence. So that's what the board means about club excellence. We follow the program, we support others, we lift each other up, and we recognize each other. So I have forgotten about this until when I was preparing for this speech, but Toastmasters International Brand Promise. And you'll hear board members talking about the brand. Are you, is your club living out the brand? Well, what does that mean? We use the banner. We have logos on our paper. That's the brand. Well, here's the brand promise. Empowering individuals through personal and professional development. Are we a professional development organization? This is the promise Toastmasters International makes to club members. Once we have reached this goal consistently through all clubs across the globe, we have achieved club excellence. I don't know how many club leaders, district leaders, area leaders, division leaders, international leaders we have on this call. But I know when I started realizing that club excellence meant having a really good Toastmasters meeting, following the agenda, the program, making sure we have a great speech, a great evaluation, some opportunities for unscheduled people to speak and table topics, good feedback that not only helps us give people ideas about what they did well, but helps us tell people an opportunity to get better, not criticism. Although I laughed when I read Ralph Smedley's book, he did talk about criticism because back in the 20s was a different culture. And criticism, a critique was what they did. But I like to say, we tell you what you do well so that other people that are new can say, oh, that's something I should try and do. And we help you get better, meaning it was already good. Let's get better. That's how we inspire people. That's how we lift them up. That's how we protect them because we show them that they did some things well. So everything we do affects the team. And I didn't realize how team-oriented Toastmasters was until I started being on some teams. And at first, I didn't hear it. I just thought, oh, okay, we'll go through this drill and do all this stuff. And I guess it's important. But the more I grew and moved up the ladder to more training with Toastmasters, I started realizing everything I do affects every member. My negativity in a meeting 
it might be directed at somebody or it might be directed at, oh, maybe some new program in Toastmasters. And if I'm being negative, does it help my members? Maybe I should figure out a way to turn that frown upside down and figure out how to like it. Because there have been some things come along in Toastmasters that took me a while to warm up to. And I've heard from the 15 years before I joined that there were some items that came along that people didn't like that by the time I joined were just part of normal. So I'm going to encourage all of us as part of a team to figure out how we can take whatever we think about the group, the organization, the part of it that I'm in right now, the club, the area, the division, the district, or even an international role. And how can I turn it into something positive? Make lemonade. Because when our members see us making lemonade and having a smile on our face, like I can see on Lisa's face right now, it makes life better. And even though Mark Eaton didn't write about that in his book, I think turning the frown upside down ought to be the fifth secret of a winning team. So how do you do that? I bet you've seen a club success plan. That thing is long and a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to do this. Must admit, I've been one of those. In fact, when I was first in the trio, I thought that way about the district success plan. Don't feel that way anymore. Because if you sit down with your team, and you've never been a leader before, but you're that person that got called in to be the president, here's how you lead. Bring the club success plan, show it to everybody, ask each officer to take it home and think about their part and write down what they think they would like to see the club accomplish. They'll come to the part about the budget and they may, your club may not have any money, you may not have dues, just tell them, don't worry about anything you come up with. Dream big. Remember Ryan Avery, our world champion of public speaker, speaking about seven years ago? He's all about dream big. You know, you might just get there. So let everybody dream big. Come back together. I like to do it because teams usually start in Toastmasters in the summer. I like to do it on my back patio. I have enough barely enough comfortable chairs for us all to sit in the shade. Well, the shade's not as important here as it is where you live. Or do you even go outside in the summer? I cannot imagine living in 115 or 18 or 20 degrees. At any rate, get together in a comfortable spot. Maybe promise adult beverages after as a reward. And start, let everyone talk about how they see their role and how the rest of the team can help them. Here's what I need. When I post on, so I'm PR. When I post on social media, I'm going to let you know. And could you go in and like, comment, and share the post? And in your comment, could you add to your personal experience how it helped you? That's supporting each other. That's doing what you're told because your PR manager asked you to do that. It's protecting others by making their posts look really good. It makes them look good. So keep thinking about these four things in all that you do. And when you come together with that club success plan, maybe someone's got an idea. Maybe when they were in that role, they can give you an idea. Or maybe they've wondered why we don't do this. Perhaps you can find a way to incorporate that. Because if you incorporate an idea of another person, you've got a fan, a fan who might want to have your back, make you look good and protect you because it's a two-way street. So I'm open for questions. I'd love to hear what you want to know. I'd love it if you come up with a question another day. I'm easy to find, thrive, don't survive, thrive every day at Gmail. That's me. I'm all about thriving, which is why working together as a team, making each other look good, protecting each other on our down days is how we thrive as a team, how our club, 
our area, our division, our district, and Toastmasters International thrives every day. Please join me in this mission, even though it's not the written mission, to help all of our members thrive every day and help other members grow in confidence and build powerful resumes to go out and take on the world. I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Linda. Oh my gosh. I was writing so many notes. I think I was the one not paying attention to the screen too well. <laughs> you, you had great eye contact. I did not because I was writing notes. You know, Lisa is our all-star. We've got to tell you, when we need something that we don't know how to get or what to do, she's the one who makes us look good for <laughs> the district, for our clubs. It don't matter which club you belong to. If you have a question... <laughs> She, and especially about um, branding, I'd never heard that before. I did not know that was part of, a, you know, like a mission statement. So I was writing that down as well. Totally amazing. What is on, I wanted a question about one thing. When, you, when I was reading your introduction, what is on your vision board? What's the top thing? The first picture that goes on my vision board every year is a picture of my family. Aww. And it's in the upper left-hand corner. And then there are quite a few words like priority, more fun time together, things like that, because that's number one. Number two, what goes on my vision board is something about health. It's usually a heart-shaped picture of cut out a salad cut out in a heart chart shape. It's, it's healthy eating. It's exercise. It's doing what I know I need to do. You may have noticed this cute little Band-Aid on my nose, those of you that are watching. Skin cancer number 11 was removed last Friday. And I'm smiling about that because whenever cancer is taken away, it makes me happy. And I do everything I can to keep my health as great as I can. Then I have my goals. Often, well, when I wanted to be a region advisor, this is a great story. I put RA. Well, there wasn't room for it. It was in what we apply for region advisor in September. I, my vision board had been up for nine months. I took the letters RA and plopped them on the beach. A picture, there's always a picture of a beach on my vision board. Funny thing, my region was Colorado up to Nebraska. No beaches, except up in Alaska. Funny thing. When Mark's, Mike Storkey called and said, we'd like you to accept the position of Region 10 advisor. I went, that's Southern California. That's the beach. So you never know how the universe will give you what's on your vision board. But I put what I want to do to have fun. And then I put the goals for my, my career. And I usually put something about what level I'm working on in Toastmasters. When I ran for international director, I'll tell you a bad secret. I did not go put international director on my vision board. That's the only Toastmaster goal I didn't put on my vision board. And it's the only Toastmaster goal I've sought that did not occur. Hmm. Oh, whoa. Lesson, large lesson learned. I encourage clubs to do vision boards. Why? Because it's a right brain, fun activity. And I say, everybody come to that club success plan meeting with pictures or words of what you think the club ought to be. And you all work together to make a vision board. My second thing about vision boards is they're not huge posters. If you have a huge poster, you feel like you have to fill it up. And so you've probably got 50 pictures. Can you accomplish 50 things this year? Maybe. May maybe Margaret Page can. Because I think Margaret Page, our president, can do almost anything. But I use 10 by 12 scrapbooking cardstock. And are you still there? Because I did something to my picture. I'm still here. Lisa's giving a thumbs up. We're still okay. here. Well, I pushed something on my computer and I have a blank, blank screen. Oh, so well, your screen off. 
Well, I don't know how I would have done that. But so technology, that is not my number one skill. <laughs> Let me tell you. Well, we got anyway. you. So we're good. Lisa, so that, did you have questions? I do. And it goes back to what you were saying with regards to the four or now five points of doing your job, what you're doing, what you're told to do, to help make others look good and protect others, and then turning the frown upside down. If you're doing all of those things and you're still meeting what I would consider negativity or negative resistance to that, especially from within the club, do you ignore it or address it? And what would be the best way to address it if that becomes the choice? So that's a really good question. And I will be the first one to tell you that I love to avoid conflict and I love to give in in my personal life. When I became region advisor, I realized that that was not something you could do. I was lucky as district governor that we had a really good team all the years I was in the trio. We had a really good team in our district. Um, I'm very grateful to be in District 26. But I, I met some districts that didn't really feel that way about their trio or about maybe some of their current leaders or some of their past leaders that still wanted to get mad when they didn't do things the way they thought it should be done and that type of thing. My number one advice is to have coffee or lunch or happy hour. <laughs> that helps turn the frown upside down with the naysayers one-on-one -on -one. just say, you know, I know there's some things that you don't like about what's going on. Let's get together and talk about it and see what we can figure out. Some things you can help. Sometimes just being listened to. I've even discovered when I was governor that I had an email chain for all the past district governors. And once a week, I told them what was going on. They loved me because not everybody pays attention to past leaders. And sometimes I think our members that have been around a while are feeling left out. They've done all the roles. They're not the new kid on the block anymore. And people take them for granted. And sometimes in our society, we do that with people who are my age and older. So meet with those people. The other thing is pathways is one of those places where people just have a problem. And Pathways, last time I checked, isn't going away. I was a late adopter of Pathways. wonder why. I'm the technologi technologically unskilled. So figuring out how to get in and find out what I needed to do and then figure out how to get back there again, uh, I thought I'd pull my hair out. I thought I'm just not going to do manual speeches anymore. And then I went, that's not supporting the team. I need to learn to do this. So I found a friend to help me learn how to do it. And I do pathways. I'm working, haven't finished a path yet, but I'm almost done with one closer on a second one. And I have the third and the fourth in progress. And I'm loving the new experiences that it's in encouraging me to do, but I don't know that some of our members will ever come around. So how can we make them feel valued? Now, the brand experience that we promise is that you'll see all members following the program. Well, how can they follow the program? Sign them up as mentors to mentor new members, mentor new members on their speaking skills, mentor new members on their research your topic skills, mentor new members on their use technology skill. Okay, old members too. Have Help fun. them feel important and don't get too mad at them. I know Pat Johnson and some of the past presidents won't like this, but if they're not going to do the Pathways program, but they will help support other members that do want to do the Pathways program, and you can get them to say positive things of that one little piece they like, you might be able to turn some people around. So find a way to make them look good. I think sometimes people are not willing to engage past leaders because they don't want to be told what to do by past leaders or, well, back in the day we did this, well, right now we're still going through 
the pandemic and things are not the same as what they would have been saying their year. So that might be one reason why we sometimes resist reaching out to them. And to your point, we should be anyway. If you start recognizing them. So every time, you know, I would go to a district, con, an area contest and I was the club coach chair and I, I didn't really know all the protocol yet. We, we announce our leaders. We announce our current leaders. We don't always announce our past district directors because, well, that takes time. That's a waste. And I wait, wait a minute, whose shoulders are we standing on in this district? And so anytime I got the floor, if the past district leaders had not been recognized, I'd say, I'd like all of our past district, I was a governor. So I would say, I would like all of our past district governors to stand up. And I'd just like to go from left to right. And would you let us know when you were governor and your name and what club or clubs you belong to? You should have seen them. It was like, wow, we just got let out of the closet. It made a difference because we had more governors coming back, being positive and helping us. And it was wonderful. There's such a great support if we can get rid of the negativity or help them learn, as I said earlier in the program, to bite their tongue. Well, that's what we did, I think, with Lisa. I mean, we put you, we did not have her go in an officer position this year. I think it's the first time in how many years, Lisa? In six of the seven. Six of the seven. We thought we'd give her a little break, but it's funny how much we still lean on her. <laughs> Sometimes I feel a little guilty, but not really. No, I'm here to help. <laughs> She's a library like you, Linda. <laughs> we only have one minute left. I really, really want to thank you, Linda, with that one minute. This has been amazing. I know you're not real fond of webinars, but the wisdom that you shared today. Like I said, I was taking notes so much. It's going to take me an hour to fill out your, your evaluation. <laughs> but it's always lovely to see you. Tell Beth hello for us. And is there anything else? Thank you for coming today, and we will share this when we get our link for the um, Zoom. We'll share it with you so you can share this with others at, in Colorado or whatever state you're in at the time or <laughs> visiting. Maybe we'll see you in London again this year, I hope. Maybe Lisa will come with us. Let's plan on it. London, Ireland, you got it. <laughs> Ireland, one of those awesome. Co Colleen and I are both a bit Irish, so I bet we go back again. <laughs> <laughs> yes but like i said i want to get one of them to see if they would speak out of this one of these as well and you're always embedded back to any of our lunch and learns okay Have a wonderful afternoon thank you thank you and that coffee mug i showed earlier did you see that yes you want well, mute? yeah we're raffling those off your name will go into a hat and we'll see who wins this month <laughs> thank fun. you linda thank you thank Take you care,